89.9, KMOJ-FM, and KMOJ-HD, Minneapolis, bringing unity to the community. 89.9, KMOJ, <laughs> the people's station. Welcome to Day One with hosts Atum Azahir and Anthony Taylor. The views and opinions of this program are not necessarily those of the staff, management, or board of directors of 89.9 KMOJ. And welcome to day one. This is Anthony and Elder Atum whispering to Elder Mahmoud. We got a full house here at the studio. So anyway, Camel J Summer, what's happening, Mom? Uh, not much. <laughs> I'm surrounded by by so much right now that uh, I I missed that question. How so, how uh, how are you doing? Good. You guys yes. are riding on Sunday yeah, in the good. middle of this huge storm. And you made it back. Was it for MS? Yep, it was for MS. So it was a long weekend, but it was a good cause. Hung out with the people we know. Congratulations, Natalie Lee. Big days of riding, 75 miles. And so anyway, safe mm-hmm. you out there. See you soon. Um, and a lot of people, North Point, Team North Point. Yes. Um, who rode it as a team. So hello to Dr. Gilliam and company. Yes. And uh, so that was really, you know, it was a good weekend. So yeah. people living well. But yeah. um, anyway, so school's out officially, and so now that school is out, school is in, right? Is that so now? Well, we're hoping that school is in, <laughs> but but guess what? We get to talk about that today. We do get to talk about. We it. get we to talk about that today. We had this phone call today from uh, a sister who uh, we thought, you know, we know her, and she's at the Cam and J family, and um, she offered us the opportunity to have Dr. Uma, Uma Johnson on our show today. And Anthony and I, as you know, in the community, we really try our best to kind of tee up uh, a discussion that often uh, is could be classified as controversial in our community. And we always try to ask you, the day one audience, who we think is the bomb. I mean, you are the best intellectually prepared <laughs> on top of things audience in the world so we really really appreciate you uh, uh, calling us and staying with us and today you have to listen so I'm going to give the number out right away because I'd like you to be ready uh, Dr. Umar will introduce himself and his topic he is going to be at the Capri Theater tomorrow night and I know that many of the people that I've spoken to just today since I since we knew he was coming on, who have said they were really, really looking forward to it and warned me that this would be uh, one of the special shows that we have had and told us that uh, about how your your mind works and how your thoughts um, take life. Um, and so we're really, really grateful that you were able to join us today. So I think, um, Anthony, was there anything else you wanted to say just by way of uh, well, I introduction. Think, not really. I mean, you know, I mean, we we were talking about it. We were talking about education this morning, and so I think that uh, um, you know, Dr. Johnson, who um, has a really, I mean, I, I mean, a really interesting bio. But the part of the bio, I think, uh, that I think is really strong is is, is an idea of being unapologetically African. Um, that is really important. I mean, that I mean, you can read through bios and find things that I think are very, very clear. And one of the things that uh, you and I talk about is this idea of what is it that helps black people make this leap to the idea of acknowledging their Africanness, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in a really mm-hmm. important way. Yeah. Um, and as we go through what's happening you know, right now, we talk that there's there's a fight going on, of course, around race and racism and white privilege and you know all these things. And one of the things that um, that I that I'm having a conversation I'm having with young people and people that are smart is this idea of growing intellectually and academically. Uh, Dr. Umar Johnson is a doctor, right? So he he has gone through uh, the educational system in this country. I mean, right? Yes. Sir. And um, gone through it. And this is what we were talking about, Mom. Is this idea how do we embrace there is an academic institution here and get through it? in a way where we get through unscathed, 
Right, so that. Well, I don't know about unscathed. Well, I'm, I mean, but, but, you get through it, and <laughs> when you get on the other well, side you, of it, you, you do are get able on the other side, but unapologetically but, black. Exactly, or and that was what I thought was yeah. really compelling about uh, Dr. Johnson's resume in terms of reading it, and that you get out on the other side, mm-hmm. and then from the perspective of what's important, you then you go to work on behalf of your people mm-hmm. in an unapologetic way. Right. So I want to introduce uh, Dr. Umar Johnson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you doing? All is well. Glad All to is be well. here. Yeah, welcome back to the city. Thank you very much. So, um, it is. So, it really is beautiful. It is today. And I'm okay, before we got the call from Sister Anika, we actually were having the conversation yep. about the idea of how we as families will engage the educational system in this country, mm-hmm. uh, the strategies that we have to employ mm-hmm. so that we can have our children get through it. I think that's how I was teaching through yeah. this system yeah. um, with mm-hmm. the least amount of damage, right? Finding yeah. the least worst place in some regards. Mm-hmm. And so you are an institution builder as well as an intellectual thinker, writer, teacher, educator, community builder. So maybe talk to us about your journey and talk to us about this, what you're building. Uh, well, first off, I would say that one of the reasons I was able to come out of my university education unapologetically African was due to the fact that I went in knowing who I was. So Mm -hmm. I already had that protective psychological armor, if you would. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of African youth, even when I look at my peers who went through the university process with me, and I attended three different universities, and I was able to actually watch and see firsthand how many Africans lost themselves in that process Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they never knew who they were in the first place. Mm -hmm. So for many of us, we actually forge our identity within the context of white supremacy, Mm -hmm. which means we end up ultimately being nothing more than a tool for them against Mm -hmm. our own selves. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is really powerful. I also have the honor of uh, uh, recommending books uh, Mm -hmm. often in was looking at um, someone who is positioning Dr. Du Bois mm-hmm. uh, in terms of a classicist, you know, mm. a classical philosopher. Yes. And um, I and my husband and I argue uh, because my husband is the best, greatest philosopher in the entire world. Um, and, and that's how you stay married. <laughs> but but also he and I have this discussion about uh, about Dr. Du Bois. Well, one thing that he said here, which I want to uh, hear you talk about, he says, Du Bois really want, was very distinct in his desire to see African people be what we now call race people. In other mm-hmm. words, commit to and invest in your own identity and your own development, your own um uh, capacity to be by yourself in order to be with other people. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but mm-hmm. that's what I hear you saying. Yes, but when you, as a Garveyite, yes. obviously when you bring up <laughs> W.E.B. Du Bois, it's a mission. I knew you were a uh, Because so. I think W.E.B. Du Bois very effectively, he represents that internal struggle Mm -hmm. that many African people deal with. He, you know, was conflicted all of his life. And I think that one of the reasons he helped to destroy Marcus Garvey so effectively was due to what he felt was a God-given right to lead because he did have the blood of the slave master, because he did have the degrees from Harvard, Mm -hmm. and he never Mm -hmm. forgave Garvey Mm -hmm. for the fact that Garvey was able to organize better than him and all his contemporaries and, and put Garvey together. And Garvey and the with, masses, the yes, regular masses. With ma- no mm-hmm. degrees from the white university. Yes. But when Du Bois talked about his souls of black folk, how within us is this struggle. Yes. A white consciousness and a black consciousness. Yes. Forever at odds with each other, whose spiritual strength alone keeps it from tearing itself apart. So how do you describe that? So so mm-hmm. so talk to well, see, talk I never, to I never struggle with... Mm-hmm. I never struggled with the multiracial, biracial consciousness of a W.E.B. Du Bois. I really believe, uh, essentially, from a psychological standpoint, that Du Bois wanted to be accepted by white folk. He wanted it very badly. Mm-hmm. And when you look at his life, he went out of his way to gain that from teaching at UPenn, the Harvard doctorate, the Fisk, Berlin, NAACP. Mm-hmm. He did all he could to be accepted by white folk, only to found out at nearly a hundred years old mm-hmm. that they will never accept right. you no matter how much white blood you have 
And so, look how he ended his life. Yes, he quit yes. the NAACP, gave up his American citizenship, and moved to Africa. And this, and and he, you know, and, and actually, um, and I. When at the hundredth anniversary of the publishing of Souls of Black Folk, in a forward that he wrote for that, what he acknowledged was his underestimation of the talented tense ability to resist assimilation, and and that's something that flew under the radar for many many people. But what mm-hmm. you're saying is very very true. At the end of his life, he acknowledged. Um, that reality, one that that white America was never going to accept him. There was nothing to have, and mm-hmm. that 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 uh, that there was something mm-hmm. in the strategy of the talented tenth that was mm-hmm. flawed um, mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. So, so let me do this because um, clearly we we are in. Uh, we are going to keep going on this six one two three seven seven three four five six. Please give us a call. Join the dialogue with us today. Um, Anthony and I are joined by first of all Atimwa, who is here. And we're also joined by Dr. Umar Johnson. And uh, so, t- so once again, let me just, um, uh, I would love to continue the discussion about these ideas around the fight between Du Bois and Garvey and the followers <laughs> of the two. Mm-hmm. And this idea of the educated and the quote unquote uneducated and mm-hmm. the value uh, we constantly work with this idea of organizing and bringing our people uh, up from, again, the mm-hmm. kind of enslavement uh, mentality. And I know, once again, as I've listened to you, so do you. So just um, some things that you see key to us mm-hmm. recovering our own, again, self in order to move forward. I would say quickly three things. One thing, we suffer from a psychological homelessness that no other group in America has to deal with. We are the only people who are not psychologically connected to an ancestral homeland. Mm -hmm. Chinese have that, Arabs have that, East Indians have that, Mexicans have that, we don't have it. Mm -hmm. Not only that, we are not interested in reconnecting to that ancestral homeland. Mm -hmm. So you're Mm -hmm. dealing with a perpetual invisibleness that African people struggle with. That psychological homelessness is related to another issue, and that is an inferiority complex Mm -hmm. that we have not accepted, Mm -hmm. have not yet confronted, Mm -hmm. and have refused to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that inferiority complex remains despite the Black Book Revolution, Mm -hmm. the cultural revolution, Mm -hmm. the black consciousness movement Mm -hmm. that we are in the midst of today. It stays, and the reason it stays is many of us think that you can replace indoctrination with information you can't totally can't see if someone is addicted to cigarettes you can give them a book about cigarette addiction that don't end the addiction yes, they still yes, have yes. to work through the process of weakening that attraction to that chemical that's black folk you can tell us all day about our problem but do we want to go through the hard painful work of killing mm-hmm. the cracker that lives within inside mm-hmm. of us we have this is this is really powerful one scan six one two three seven seven three four five six we have we as in the work that mm-hmm. that we are doing uh we have talked a lot about the erasure principle and the kind of the kind of erasure of our sense of origin and mm-hmm. of an originality mm-hmm. um as human beings. We also talk about uh cultural amnesia mm-hmm. those terms seem to be parallel with what you're saying. Yes. How about this idea of historical trauma? How do you, because everybody's talking about it, uh-huh. post-traumatic slave syndrome, all mm-hmm. of those things. What? How do you uh, talk about those? Trauma is critical to understanding and rectifying the black American reality. And that is because traumatized people, I don't care if they're sexually traumatized, physically traumatized, emotionally traumatized, traumatized people can't do two things that are absolutely necessary for any quote-unquote normally function person. Number one, you have to be able to perceive your reality accurately. Yes. The essence of mental illness is an inability to perceive your phenomenon uh, effectively. Yes, yes. So you got to perceive reality effectively. And second, you have to engage it effectively as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't interpret our reality Mm -hmm. effectively, Mm -hmm. nor can we come up with effective Mm -hmm. solutions because our interpretation of what's going on is not accurate. So, 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 Sister Atiyah, yeah. I just want you to know you you made her weak. <laughs> well, well, no, no. I mean, I think. Well, but I think. But I mean, <laughs> what saying. I what I what I really want to <laughs> say quickly. I'm sorry, Anthony. Jump in there. What I want to ask um, is uh, something that comes up as we have this very same uh, discussion mm-hmm. with people. 
something that comes up is this idea of blaming the victim. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. that if I'm too hard mm-hmm. in my kind of um, almost pleading mm-hmm. uh, with our people to really take responsibility for their own recovery, uh, cultural resurrection, mm-hmm. um, claiming of an intellectual as well as a psychological homeland. Mm-hmm. When I do that and have to talk about what we were going to talk a little bit about today, the ghettoization of our own perceptions of ourselves, mm-hmm. I often am challenged to, uh, with this idea of blaming the victim. Mm-hmm. Could you speak to that? Here's the, here's the problem, and the black church will have to be taken to task on this. Part of that blaming the victim piece grows out of the fact that we as a people have an external locus of control. We have been reared in a context and culture that suggests something has to come from what outside of us to save us. Yes. You understand? So black people feel that when you're asking them to be the catalyst for their own solution, their own resurrection, they see it as blaming the victim because we've been conditioned to think that something external must bring about this so whether it's a white jesus coming down from heaven whether it's the united states government with reparations but it must be something outside of me that must ultimately save me and that is a condition that's keeping us stuck in political quicksand so uh 612-377-3456 i am told often when you guys don't call that you're sitting at home (laughs) listening and tracking because what I do know is that you are listening because we, once again, we know you. And um, I, uh, so I'm just going to give the number 612-377-3456. I know you have wanted uh, you in the audience to ask the question, what can you do? Mm-hmm. What can you do when you at this point in time are basically addicted to, to the European system, addicted mm-hmm. to European psychology? I know you want to ask this brother, what can I do to recover myself? Mm-hmm. So give us a call, 612-377-3456. And you say that, and, I'm, and I am, I, I feel like that's optimistic. I, <laughs> you think it's optimistic? I am very concerned that the idea, that the acknowledgement that it would take for someone to go, what can I do to fix, feel, heal, feel, you know, fix mm-hmm. my addiction, heal my trauma, it, it really requires them to accept something that is that is very difficult to accept sometimes and I and I think um, um, in some and, and for some people that is the the uh, the validation and success that they were having in their own life mm-hmm. um, so I don't know mom I don't know if people mm-hmm. are asking that so well, let's check in the toughest part of therapy <laughs> is getting them to accept they got a problem which is what he's yes and tra- and the the work that we are doing now with someone who's doing trauma therapy is mm-hmm. even more because denial is one hell of a thing yes you yes know, everyone comes to therapy denying the drug addict that's the, the pedophile yes and black folk we have been in a perpetual 150 years state of denial, state of denial. Mm. welcome to day one you are on the air i'm uh, torn i've been i i'm i have raised eight children i'm on my grandchildren now and they're very resilient and being a white person in the family, very often I see racism they don't see or choose not to see. And in that resiliency, they seem to lose touch with how things should be. And But on the flip side of that, when you say owning it and changing it and, you know, doing it from within, um, it's very hard. They have a double battle. They're not only trying to save themselves, they're trying to save their community. When you feel like it's that your whole community is involved in bringing you down, Mm -hmm. it takes it to another level. It's very Mm -hmm. easy to say to save yourself, but there's such a a, a feeling of of this is just how it is. Yes, yes. Especially in that complacency that you, how do you, how do I, I I couldn't even get my kids to stop watching Dr. Amnesty. Okay. okay, so let us... So what do you know about that? How right. do I inspire that? Okay, let us have Dr. Umar speak to you on that. Okay, thank your you. Your question, thank you. Well, given all those children that she's helping to raise... I would hope she comes out tomorrow to the lecture at the Capri Theater at 6 p.m. But here's the thing. All victims of systematic oppression, black, white, purple, or orange, they, imi- they see imitation of the oppressor as the way out. This is why African-Americans are so um, interested in going to college. We respect education, 
But college has a special uniqueness and importance for us because we don't not only see it as a way of upward social mobility, we see it as a way of doing a better job at copying the oppressor. And we see that in copycatting the oppressor, potentially we could be drafted by the oppressor to participate in his reality. In other words, the average black person doesn't have a problem with white supremacy. They have a problem with the role that white supremacy gave them. And if you improve their role under the system, they will be content with it. And this is why a lot of revolutionaries, if you study our history, Mm -hmm. they started out Mm -hmm. with a strong black fist. Mm -hmm. But once the jobs came Mm -hmm. and the opportunities came, Mm -hmm. that fist went down. Mm -hmm. Jesse Jackson is a good example. Al Sharpton is a good example. Mm -hmm. And there's dozens of them because they were really not against racism. What they were never fighting for was systematic change. They wanted a better opportunity for themselves. So I want to just uh, check in um, 612-377-3456. Welcome to day one. You're on the air. Hey, how you guys doing, my brother, my sister? How y'all doing today? We're doing good, Hotep. How are you? How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I just saw, I heard, I was listening in and I kind of heard about um, a lot of people of color feel like the, the, the help has to come from from outside of us, you know, when you guys mentioned about that. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to talk about that. I, I had a question. You know, us as, I don't want to say elders, but the, the community leaders or the fathers or the mothers of the community, sometimes we do feel like we want to say something because I think knowledge is going to be the key to help everyone. And, it's, and we have to have a community effort in raising the kids. And I've seen things, I've, I've seen people do things where I wanted to, you know, give some of the knowledge that I've gained. Um, and sometimes I feel like my brothers and sisters don't perceive that information very well. Okay. Um, okay. Coming from, you know, a black man, you know, they, they, they perceive it. They don't, they don't take it the way I, I intended to go. Okay, okay. And so I just wanted to know, what, how do you guys feel that we can give the information and let them know that it's coming from a place of love and not hate. Okay. Well, Thank you so much for your phone one call. One thing where we have fallen short of as adults in relation to our youth, we only give them information. We don't give them opportunities. So let's say you got a Chinese kid, you got a European Jewish kid, and you got an African American kid. That And I just came back from China two weeks ago for the first time speaking. The Chinese business The European Jewish man is going to give the European Jewish kid a job. And the African-American man is going to give the African-American boy a book about black history. That's not going to get it done. We can't just tell our our youth how great we used to be. We have to give them an opportunity to become great again. See, the history will only hold their attention so long. If the opportunity doesn't come behind that, we're going to lose them. And the problem is the only thing we have to offer our children is knowledge of self. It's not good enough no more. And given the fact that we're a trillion dollar people, last year we spent nine billion on perm. Last year we spent two billion on Air Jordans, six hundred million on McDonald's, and four billion on alcohol. With that type of spending power, a job, and within that job, you could require that they learn knowledge of self and alone is not gonna save us. Well, uh, clearly have a lot to talk about. And so take uh, one more call and then a few more minutes so you can talk about what you, what mm-hmm. your topic is for tomorrow night. Okay. Welcome to day one. You're on the air. Hotep. Hotep. I, have a to get in. I just wanted to add, uh, Dr. Umar started to touch on it a little bit. Um, you know, the idea that we need to determine in different ways outside of these large and deep social constructs that say white supremacy, that's the way to go, the way to achieve success. Yes. And I I, want to be clear, what we need is clear, concrete steps on how to do that. We oftentimes focus on the problem. We we continue to harp on how we got here. Mm -hmm. But what our people need are concrete steps that they can apply to their lives. Mm -hmm. We know that our resources in the people we need to reconnect to one another. We need to start to be a resource to one another, which means we have to rebuild trust, which means we have to be in space together in order to do that. So is there a formula, uh, you know, a 12 step process? How, how do we get to the actual application? Um, and the bottom line is that we, we are all, the only resource that we have 
Um, and in order to get to the point where we have institutions and businesses that, and things to pass down to our children, we must separate. All right. Hotep. Sister Hotep, thank you so much for your phone call. Two, two quick points on that. Number one, white supremacy and its wicked wisdom has diversified the identities and loyalties of black people to the point that at present, it would be almost impossible to bring us together for unity because of how they have diversified loyalty. So, for example, some of us identify as being African. Others want to be that. Others want to be this. Others want to be biracial, multicultural. OK, some identify exclusively with this sexual orientation to the exclusion of race. So because they've created this alphabet soup amongst a once homogenous people, that identity crisis is at the core. Until you address the identity crisis, it'll be difficult to address other things. But here's what I want to say, Queen Mother. Focus on the children. Our problem is we spend all of our time trying to resuscitate adults. They're gone. As a therapist, I can tell you 90% of people who come to therapy will never get help. The alcohol addicts, the low self-esteemers, the depressives, they will never change because they're not ready to. But yet we have youth Young children mm -hmm. every day who mm -hmm. are growing up mm -hmm. and we don't invest the time in them mm -hmm. to make sure they don't mm -hmm. become like us. Mm -hmm. I believe 80 percent of our attention should go on the youth, only 20 percent on the adults. Mm -hmm. But right now we spending all of our attention on mm -hmm. adults who are irredeemable in neglecting the babies. Is this accelerated by technology? I mean, yes. the, especially the yes. idea of the the continued kind of segmentation of people that otherwise would mm -hmm. collect as black sure. people and work exactly. as black people. The right? thing happened to us with social network. Yeah. The mm -hmm. worst thing happened to black right. people social network mm -hmm. because it's actually pushing us further apart mm -hmm. than bringing us together because you can just hide behind an online identity well, and, and, and never participate that's right. in dialogue. And, and so the idea of an identity, the other thing this is, is interesting is the idea of identity now becomes uh, equ equal to um, your social network status, right? Yes. And so it actually gets stranger, mm -hmm. right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Because you wind up with, with these new, um, you know, mm -hmm. these new mm -hmm. groups of people that can yes. collect to thousands mm -hmm. of other people mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. identify in a false identity that, that again becomes... Electronic multiple personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Electronic wow. multiple personality disorder. So... Um, um, uh, let me let me just say that um, uh, there's so much to talk with you about. Um, let's talk about tomorrow night. I think uh, tell us what your it sounds like your topic is one that many, many of us struggle with every day. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to focus on the uh, miseducation machine. So I want all the parents to come out. And of course, white mothers of black children need to be there, too, because they're raising our babies. I'm going to talk about the school to prison pipeline, special education, the learning disability, why we have a rise in autism, the psychiatric meds, the Adderall, the Concerta, the Ritalin, the Metadate, the Prozac, and why you need to think twice about giving your child that. Mm -hmm. I want to dispel some of the rumors about special education, mental health in black children. We have to talk about the role of the white female teacher in the miseducation of the black boy. Why is the dropout rate so high? Mm -hmm. Why do we have so few African-American male principals and teachers? Mm -hmm. What is the function of public education when America no longer has jobs mm -hmm. for black people? Mm -hmm. But most importantly, I want to teach parents their rights. I need them to know what they can demand when they walk into that school. You can demand to see your child's records, okay? You have a right to refuse special ed. You have a right to refuse the ADHD evaluation. School law is its own universe. Black parents know very little about it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here in Minneapolis to teach them about it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And this is tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, Capri. Capri Theater. Doors mm -hmm. open up at 4. And I'll be signing copies of my book, which I got to get you guys copies. Mm -hmm. I forgot to bring them with me. Mm -hmm. Psychoacademic Holocaust, the mm -hmm. special education and ADHD wars against mm -hmm. black boys. And we're going to have a QA. Mm -hmm. So, brothers and sisters, we'll be able to ask questions. And if any of you guys are coming, make sure you give me your name. Y'all won't have to pay. Because mm -hmm. so, y'all had me on the show. So again, well, we, this yes. is tomorrow evening at the Capri Theater, 6 p.m. Uh, the Capri Theater is on Broadway Avenue, and it's actually Ilion, I think, is the actual street. But again, just west, I'm sorry, just mm -hmm. east of Penn Avenue on Broadway, the beautiful Capri Theater, It'll be Dr. Umar Johnson at 6 p.m. on June 14th. And all children are free, 17 and younger. All children are free, and all elders, 65 and older also free they just mm -hmm. have to show up mm -hmm. well once again we want to first of all thank you so much for your thank work you. and i think that when you are here again we will sure. we would love 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 to talk to you about 
uh, the work that we're doing, which we, uh, you are familiar, and I know you are. I heard you're the prince of Pan-Africanism. You know it. And so <laughs> we are uh, uh, with you in that, and we go. All, we do go to Kemet, and we do a mm. lot, a lot of work with Kemet. Powerful. And the spiritual philosophy that has to be uh, um, incorporated into the curriculum for us is and how incorporated into our healing and into our healing yes. and into our lives, yes. and so we want you to see how we do that. Certainly. So Certainly. we appreciate you very, you. very Thank much, and we mind. will recruit for you for tomorrow night. For appreciate people to that. Attend. So yes, appreciate sir. People. So All again, right. the people get there tomorrow evening. Join Elder Atun, who will be standing outside recruiting <laughs> uh, Dr. Umar <laughs> Johnson's speech tomorrow night at the Capri Theater, six p.m. Yes. Um, thank you all for listening, and as always, in the pursuit of a life and balance each day is day one hotep everyone sure. thank you for listening to day one with hosts atu masahir and anthony taylor tune in to day one next tuesday at 6 p.m on 89.9 kmoj the people station good evening twin cities join kmoj and some of our on-air talent as